All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, so hi, hi everyone. I'm Ryan Beisner with NVIDIA, and I'm here with my colleague Tomasz Knopik, and we're here to talk about our experience in handling uh, image logistics and locality in a global multi-cluster deployment. Um, looking at our agenda real quick, first we will, and I think uh, Tomax on the slides, yes, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll talk first about our use cases um, that are specific to you know, our, our challenges and, and we'll talk about the challenges themselves that we've experienced. Um, next, we'll uh, detail the approaches that we've settled on as well as the alternatives that we considered along the way. And of course, we'll leave time for discussion and Q&A. Uh, throughout the, this session, uh, the theme is, is most succinctly um, summarized by, by the following, which is basically uh, something I arrived at after looking through our uh, requirements for you know, diving into this, which is I need my VMI images. I need them now. I need them everywhere across multiple clusters, you know, no pressure, right, in doing that. Um, moving on to the um, the meat of the presentation, uh, next slide, if you will. So before we dive into the details of our use case, uh, I'd like to first have a peek at the, the big picture of NVIDIA VM image distribution in this particular system. This is a, a simplified diagram. There are a lot of components and workflows that are not shown here, but at a high level, Essentially what you have is there are tenants, they need to build and publish their specific VM images. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, quite simplified, we, we use public cloud resources as one of the paths to distribute these images globally. But a lot of the logic, in fact, most of the logic and function happens in our own data centers. So let's switch back and look at the details of our use case. And uh, once we get through that, we'll, I'll turn it over to Tomas and he'll tell us about the, the approaches and the alternatives. So moving to the next slide, um, talking about our high level use cases at NVIDIA. Uh, we have workloads that need to run on both Windows and Linux, but not all of these workloads are particularly well suited for a container. Um, imagine applications um, such as like a VDI-like experience where you're presenting virtual desktops or cloud gaming uh, around the world at the scale of tens of thousands of nodes, right? Um, so we're using Kubernetes, we're using Kubert and a lot of other open source uh, components to make that happen as well as um, some things that are specific to our systems. Um, the next bit of our use case is that most of these require some form of acceleration. We use GPU acceleration naturally for, for certain workloads um, and DPU network offloading to, um, to handle a lot of the, the, the network functions. Across the system, we optimize for low latency throughout um, and that actually can be a bit at odds with running a system at such a scale with uh, high queries per second um, across data centers. So uh, another use case of ours is that the virtual machine lifecycle is generally pretty short, right? We, not, there are not a lot of uh, long-lived workloads. There are some, but, but uh, the, the bulk are a fairly short-lived lifecycle. The images that back these workloads can be quite large and they can have a high churn, right, to accommodate new applications and new content and new updates along the way. Um, as a note, we do uh, use storage hot plug, but uh, currently VM migration or live migration are not necessarily uh, required for our use cases. So next slide. Talk a, a bit about um, you know, the behavior that, that we anticipated um, and some of the specifications going into managing the VM images. So, one of the core specifications is that our tenants need to be able to quickly and easily start VMIs with, with the VM images. Um, backed by another core spec, um, that is to have a global source of truth for all of the uh, VM images in our, in our catalog. And as I mentioned, these can be released quite frequently, sometimes daily or weekly, right? So we have to be able to efficiently distribute these things. Uh, one attribute to take into consideration is that many of the images are you know, around 50 gigabytes. Um, so 20 to 50 is sort of what we see in, in, that, in that image size. I'd like to talk next, just uh, setting the foundation on the data center outlay on the next slide. So we have uh, data centers that are located around the world, as I mentioned. And while we do have uh, good practices around hardware versioning, 
at this scale, you always need to be able to handle heterogeneous hardware in some sense, right? And so um, we have some applications that are specific to CPU architecture, for example. Uh, hence, we need to be able to handle different types of image builds based on the CPU architecture. Um, any given host in our data center typically needs to be ready to launch multiple different VM images at any given point in time. And um, as I mentioned, these data centers uh, represent physical hardware. Uh, these, are, these are systems that we operate at NVIDIA. Um, as is true of you know, most data centers, resources such as CPU, memory, network, and storage um, can be a challenge. And, and in our case, these are fixed assets per data center, and we pack them pretty tightly. We, we highly utilize systems. And so even with all of these challenges, just to circle back, I still need VMI images. I need them now when I need them everywhere across multiple clusters. So, um, so let's move to the next slide where, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks here are probably operating some production systems and, and with production systems naturally come service level objectives. Um, so here are, uh, here's what our ours look like at a high level. Um, naturally, there are a lot of other measures that, that we, we take internally. Uh, but when an, in, when an image is published, essentially, we need to make sure that that's available at all of its target data center destinations around the globe within 24 hours. Uh, typically, this happens much more quickly, but that's, that's the, the absolute need. So each VMI spec also needs to be able to retrieve uh, that necessary image in a few seconds upon request. And with around 600 nodes per data center and each being ready to launch a set of five unique VM images, um, along with uh, a corresponding storage attachment via hot plug, that means that we have to be able to deal with hundreds of concurrent VM image requests in any given data center. And so I'll add here just that uh, copy on write is, a, is a, a requirement that Perhaps we should have had in that last slide, but uh, it, it is something that we need uh, and something that we use. So I still need my images everywhere when I need them, and I want them quickly, right? That's that's the, the premise here. Let's shift gears, though, and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've experienced here with VM image distribution on that next slide. Cool. So looking at some of the inherent challenges given these requirements and use cases that I've just described. I, I mentioned that optimizing for low latency is a priority for us. When you're faced with moving 50 terabytes of data, infrastructure services will naturally compete for some of the same system resources. Um, and so we need to be able to protect both the, the VMI workloads and the API servers and control plane resources from starvation. So taking measures to mitigate uh, the noisy neighbor concerns around, for example, north-south network traffic and east-west network throughput and latency are some of the challenges that we faced. Early in the design, um, we, we asked questions like, well, how do we safely handle, for example, image pruning? How, when, when is it safe to delete an image? Uh, and some, some of these questions may seem simple, but um, it, it can be a challenge that, that proves difficult to solve in some cases. So, Another question naturally is cost, right? So I mentioned that we do use some public cloud resources to do parts of our distribution. Um, how, how, does, how does that affect cost? How much traffic and storage is needed? Those are the kind of challenges we need to, to try to identify through testing. Um, okay, next slide, if you will. So we determined pretty quickly in our POCs that, that on-demand downloading of VM images at the request time would be far too slow for our needs and that the VM images needed to be present in the data center and on the hosts at the request time, which led to challenges surrounding capacity planning, naturally. Um, you know, you, you can always ask for more cloud storage in the public clouds, but when you're um, provisioning data centers, you have to have that very well planned out. So that's, that's one of the challenges that we naturally faced. Next slide. So uh, just a couple other challenges I wanted to note. Um, you know, we're constrained by, as I mentioned, the, the data center physics, essentially. These are, these are designed systems with, with fixed amounts of hardware and power. Um, we, we don't have the ability to, to scale that on the fly. And that, so that challenge translates naturally to some pretty detailed ongoing capacity planning. Um, and, and finally, when you're faced with conditions where a VM image 
isn't where you need it when you need it. Um, our, our preference, our system preference is to not schedule that VMI and to avoid that VMI creation failure altogether. Um, so next slide, if you will, we'll circle back to this diagram from earlier. Um, I'll hand things over to, to Tomas to talk about uh, how we address these challenges and, uh, and again, talking about some of the alternatives considered along the way. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, okay, uh, so having this picture in mind, uh, yeah, I'll try to discuss the approaches that we actually uh, have, ta have taken and what we have actually built, uh, as well as what we decided not to do. Um, so eventually we have implemented our own uh, storage class through container storage interface. Uh, CSI, for those who are not aware, gives ability to execute some actions upon uh, volume related events happening in the cluster. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, upon cre creation of a volume, we populate with, uh, we populate it with a correct VM image. Uh, we are able to read requested by PVC image from PVC's metadata included in its annotations. Uh, thanks to CSI flexibility, we are able to achieve the main goal of uh, copy on write support. Um, so uh, re relevant VM images are cached on local uh, storage of every host in the cluster, as Ryan was mentioning previously, that came out as a, some kind of requirement for our use case. Um, what we did uh, when we were implementing the CSI, we decoupled images down longer to have flexibility over images provider, because for the time being, we were just using single external cloud provider, but we, we never know what future brings. Um, so to, uh, to mention the uh, cache warmup that Ryan was referring to, uh, we implemented custom resource, uh, Kubernetes custom resource to give users ability to warm up the cache um, to actually achieve the mentioned before goal of instantaneous VMI image availability. So upon request to create a new VMI, the, um, the image needs to be provided within a second. So this custom resource gives host level granularity with node selector. Um, so heterogeneous clusters, uh, cl cluster support is provided. So basically for different sets of VM images, uh, tenants are able to specify node selector which, uh, which given images should be uh, available at. Um, so we have to implement our own operator, which reconciles on the creation of the custom resource. Um, the operator as well updates the status of the custom resource, which gives uh, actually visibility into warm-up progress for, for our users. Um, what we decided to do in terms of communication between operator and CSI is basically we use node labels to com communicate uh, between two of those. Uh, for instance, to inform about download completion. Um, it gives as well uh, a benefit of ability to use uh, node affinity to schedule VMIs on nodes that actually have the image. So you can specify in your VMI spec, uh, node affinity, uh, give, the, uh, give the label name with the VM image name and you are sure that actually uh, your VMI will not be scheduled uh, on a node, so it will, it will not uh, fail when the VM image is not, uh, is not available. Um, so side note about the warm-up uh, uh, warm cache is that status of download in distributed system is, is quite tricky. So it's not really reasonable to expect 100% of nodes to be, to be healthy enough to, to perform a download. So there always needs to be some small uh, margin. Um, thanks to our own CSI implementation, it's actually quite easy to implement improvements uh, requested over time by users. So some examples of that, uh, um, some examples of such improvements that help to solve our challenges are uh, limiting cluster-wide download concurrency of downloads to decrease cluster disruption. As Ryan said, we, uh, we are operating in a uh, low latency workload, so it's it's really important for us. Uh, we are able to uh, to have on-demand data persistency for some VMIs that, that require that. On the other hand, some VMIs do not, so we are able to really easily handle different use cases. 
uh, we are able to implement uh, signatures verifications with only volumes. Uh, we are uh, able as well to integrate warm up mechanism with our monitoring and automated triaging tools. So in large organizations like NVIDIA, it's not obvious that all of the users are Kubernetes experts and they have proficiency uh, with if they are uh, in it, in interacting with uh, different uh, Kubernetes abstractions. Um, so they really just want their VM up and that's it. So it's better to give them tools that, that are already familiar with like um, common monitoring stack. Um, okay, so this is again, the big picture of uh, VM image logistics. If there's one thing you should get out of the previous slides, it's, it's, it's this picture. So as you can see, uh, VMIs are able to access VM images through PVC and PV abstractions, uh, which are controlled by, by our CSI plugin. CSI plugin is uh, deployed at every worker node. So CSI that does not necessarily need to run only on control plane nodes. Um, so upon different events related to our storage class happening in the cluster, like creation, deletion of volumes, mounting and mounting them, uh, requests for cache preworm, our CSI is able to execute uh, suitable actions uh, implemented by us, like uh, starting the download or maybe copying the VM image from cache into the uh, actual volume. Uh, so the, the great, great thing about this approach is that, that it does not really introduce any new abstractions to users wanting to start a VM. They only use PVCs, volumes, annotations, and possibly warm up, uh, warm up custom resource. Um, for people more familiar with the most recent developments in Kubernetes related to storage, our CSI might sound familiar, uh, similar to a volume populator. Uh, we actually look forward to experimenting with this concept, uh, which could possibly make our solution work with many different storage classes. Um, however, the volume populators were not available at the time of creating our solution. Uh, yeah, so if you are considering implementing your own CSI based on our example, make sure to, to research volumes populators first. Um, okay, uh, next major improvement to our CSI was uh, introducing zone level VM images cache. As we mentioned before, downloading tens of hundreds, tens or hundreds of terabytes of data from external cloud storage generates a lot of ISP bandwidth and actually quite large views. Um, so yeah, we implemented a uh, multiple replica high level service for file caching. Thanks to decoupling downloader from the CSI, we are able to easily switch download source from cloud to cache. Uh, we are able to implement some strate strategies of fallback if something fails, maybe our uh, in-zone cache is not available, then we can always easily fall back to the external uh, cloud. Uh, our in-zone level cache does not really need to have strong data persistency. It's anyway guaranteed by the backing cloud storage. Uh, so the implementation of the cache actually turns out to be easier than, than it can seem. Um, so we only allow our, our CSI to talk to the cache uh, and that's achieved through Kubernetes network policies. Um, quality of service, as Ryan was mentioning, is a big deal with our low, low latency services. So we made sure to implement both storage and network uh, QoS. So we avoid being noisy neighbor to rest of our services. Um, so these services include like DCD, which is like a very, very important piece in your cluster, obviously, as well as I API server, right? You'd rather want your um, VM image download to fail rather, th rather than uh, starve AP server or, um, or bring down ETCD. Um, as a side note, if you're running like different generations, versions of either hardware or just architecture, make sure to test all of your solutions um, as well as to scale testing of each different setup and validate the quality of service uh, is configured correctly at every, um, every different setup. Um, okay, so again, this is, uh, if there's one thing to remember from the previous slide, is that we are running multi-replica in zone cache serving CSI clients, uh, basically to reduce north-south network load and reduce external storage costs. Uh, so this setup actually uh, looks really simple and has been serving us for a while now. 
and actually it's uh, reducing complaints for tenants about user fa facing issues to, during uh, BM image downloads. Um, okay, so uh, I've discussed what we did and let's, dis let's discuss now what we decided not to do and actually why. Um, so first is uh, containerized data importer known as CDI. Uh, CDI might be the most compelling alternative to a custom CSI. Uh, it's a great way to quickly bootstrap VMs. It supports a lot of required functionalities like authentication through Kubernetes secrets to, uh, to private storage. And it's certainly being used by many, many people uh, and it's reliable. Um, however, at the design time, the main requirement of copy and write in CDI was not supported, which was really important one for NVIDIA. Um, there didn't seem to be out of the box mechanism to soft level caching and per node cache warm up uh, to support instantaneous VM launch. Uh, so if we were about to use CDI, we needed to implement it, uh, implement it on our own anyway. Um, yes, so those are like primary reasons that we, why we did not decide to, to use CDI. But yeah, I'd like to highlight again that CDI might be or or likely is the solution for for majority of the use cases. It just just wasn't uh, the one for Nvidia uh, provided our our use cases. Um, okay, so instead of downloading directly from external cloud uh, from CSI, uh, we could have decided to use peer to peer solution. So basically, it would download an image once uh, to one of the nodes or just a few of nodes, and then distribute uh, chunks of the VM image between. Uh, every node. Uh, so we actually uh, were exper experimenting with this approach. We did, we did our testing. Um, we did our experiments on live clusters as well, but we did not manage to find much your solution that would actually meet all of our requirements. Uh, back in the time, the biggest concern was uh, deployment in our resources constrained environment. Mm, so the resources consumption was quite unpredictable and usual, usually over available limits. Um, yeah, so that's why we eventually uh, decided to adopt this approach. But uh, yeah, maybe, as I said previously, maybe uh, for our use case of others, it would be actually uh, the one worth considering. Mm. So uh, HTTP proxy, like for instance, NGNX could be a great alternative to in zone cache. So instead of writing your own, you can use uh, whatever is available um, at the market, usually plenty of open source solutions. Uh, it's a great and quick approach for many use cases. Um, however, we decided uh, considering our planned future improvements that it's actually better to implement our own simple file cache and have a future freedom of choice rather than to be tied to limited ex extendability of existing solutions. Uh, probably if we went with NGNX, we'd have to write some kind of uh, plugins um, uh, and so on and so on. So we decided that probably long-term vision is better to uh, to use uh, something um, something common. Um, uh, okay, so cloud provider storage cache in local regions. Um, so for instance, AWS and other external cloud providers, they offer caching solutions like um, Amazon CloudFront or Amazon Elastic Cache uh, to bring frequently uh, accessed files closer to their destinations. Uh, so it might be useful for globally spread clusters like NVIDIA's. Uh, however, we identified drawbacks that made it impossible to replace in-zone cache with external provider's cache. Uh, and mainly those were uh, ISP bandwidth, which, which actually would not be reduced and still would have to um, You'd have to have like cost at a at scale, which at scale, which which was not really acceptable for us. Um, however, one could argue that, for instance, AWS cache is not really alternative to in-zone cache, uh, but should be more treated like an alternative to a to a cloud storage. And in-zone cache could be used together with, uh, let's say, AWS cache. Um, and I think that's that's a valid point. Uh, but we did not pursue this path for now, as we as we did not identify significant measurable benefits for this approach. Uh, we already have two levels of cache, one at host level, the other in zone level. 
cache uh, in our image distribution architecture. So bringing yet another one, uh, it would ha have to have a, a solid use case. Uh, yeah. So we decided not to implement this one uh, for the time being. Um, okay, and last but not least, um, alternative would be VM images over the network approach. With this approach, you could have a powerful storage or few of them in the cluster uh, and never actually download images to, to a host. Uh, however, this approach requires significant amount of resources, memory and network. Um, hence, uh, we would have to have some kind of hardware planning and additional cost, additional purchases. Um, another downside would be that effectiveness of this approach uh, really depends on read writes profile uh, of this usage and we did not really want it to be additionally constrained. Um, so this approach did not really fit in our requirements uh, and our use case. So it was quite quite quickly uh, rejected. Um, yeah, so these are the alternatives uh, which we uh, waited mm -hmm. and we decided go with the path that we actually did that I've discussed. Uh, so far, we are we are quite satisfied with the choice. Um, okay, uh, I'll give it back to Ryan. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, in in closing, just a few more lessons learned or tips, if you will, um, from from our experiences, and and that is, of course, going into it. Um, anytime you're working with um, allocating storage, and and um, you have perhaps a, a dynamic amount of data that, that could be unpredictable. It, it, it's important to carefully plan out you know, things like your host storage partitions, if, if you're using them at all, um, and, and try to do the math on the VM image cache capacity. Uh, try to avoid you know, unnecessary churn of that cache, for example. Um, there are a lot of different things that can go right or wrong in those, in those topics. Um, another thing that uh, just to point out is, you know, planning that that VM image lifecycle ahead of time or during your POC, and and really just trying to imagine all of your use cases. Of course, this is the uh, the moving target that probably we all face in a lot of different ways. But um, uh, but yeah. So over over time, I've realized also that you know algorithms of load balancers, especially request based um, rotation, may not always be exactly fair. And if if you're in a case where you're operating dense systems flying close to the sun, so to speak, uh, you know, the, those minor differences or the minor um, discrepancies in that, in that fairness could, um, could surface in interesting ways. And so quality of service, again, is, is something to, to look at, as Thomas mentioned, both on the network and the storage side of things. Um, it, it goes without saying that, that a suboptimal network configuration can be a problem. But, but one thing that I'd like to point out is that when, when you have um, things running at a, a very large scale, uh, minor configuration um, in, inefficiencies can really be amplified, right? So just a pointer there. Um, and so if you're not able to control the network uh, quality of service, what we found in our uh, zone level cache daemon is to implementing a, uh, a controllable throughput limiting on that cache server itself was, was quite helpful uh, when considering our own sanity and operating these clusters. Um, and naturally, when you're working with Kubernetes, Kubevert, PVs, PVCs, it's important to understand and implement the features accordingly. Uh, for us, it was it was all about diving into the CSI interface and uh, specifically volume topology. Um, and so this is this is how we get our VM images um, where we need them, where uh, across the across the. Uh, uh, the world in, in a, a lot of different data centers. So before we open up to questions, and I think I see a couple out there, I just want to give a big thank you to the, the Kubert community and everyone working to organize the event. This is always enjoyable to see the content. I, there have been a lot of really good uh, presentations so far. And, and also thanks to all of you for uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, I do see a question, Tomas, in, uh, in the chat, um, do the VM, do the VMs in our setup use QCAL2 files directly? You want to take um, that yeah, yeah, sure. So basically in our host level cache, there's a QCAL2 base file. Uh, so this base image is basically playing, uh, being stored always at the cache as long as any of the uh, VMIs is using it. And the uh, 
to the to the volumes we only uh, we only like copy the difference between the base file and what what actually BMI uh, is uh, is reading is writing to a uh, to to the VM image. Uh, I'm not sure if that that answers uh, all of the questions. Feel free to message on chat. Uh, the other question would be that we are referring to BMIs and VMs. Uh, so basically, we do not use uh, so far uh, in our most of our use cases. We operate on QVIRTS VMIs abstractions. We, we don't use uh, QVIRTS VMs abstraction. Uh, that's most likely because our our VM, VMs are ephemeral, so we don't really uh, we don't really need to have the, uh, for instance, you know, persistency of data or or anything like that between uh, the reboots of a of a VM. So uh, yeah, our use case not does not really need qubits uh, VMs so far, but maybe in the future. Okay, uh, I see the follow up question. Yeah, this is the um, to achieve the copy on the right to use QCAL two layers to point to the base image. Yeah, that's that's what we do. Uh, we, we do not create uh, raw files. Okay, watching for any other questions. I think we've addressed all of that have come in. So if there are any other, um, any other questions along the way, um, we'll, I think we're both on the uh, Kubert Dev Slack channel as well. And um, yeah, thanks again for uh, taking the time to join us. I'll hand it back to Andrew. <laughs>